Um, but we're going to start in a moment. But before that, I'm really excited because we get to, uh, I have a special guest here today that I get to interview and introduce you to for some of you. Uh, her name is Jaya James, and she's the, ade- uh, yeah, all right, some people are, yeah. Yeah. I haven't even told you who she is, but you know. See, you knew. I, I knew some of you would know that. Uh, she's the executive director at Hope House, and uh, I knew some of you would, would know that, and others of you, it's like, what's Hope House? I know some of you, it's like, you, you just started coming the last few weeks, last few months, maybe the last year, and so this is like a new thing. So just to give you a little bit of context before I invite her up, uh, Hope House uh, is uh, a charity that was started in 2012 by Lakeside Church, and its vision is to eradicate poverty, which, as you're going to discover in the book of Mark, Jesus is all for. Uh, and so uh, Hope House has been founded by Lakeside Church. It's been heavily supported in its programs over the years through volunteers and donations. Uh, some 30,000, you know, just 30,000 foot view kind of understanding of Hope House. Um, they have a food market that every month feeds 1,000 separate individuals monthly. 60% of the people that actually serve and volunteer at Hope House are actually individuals who access Hope, House, Hope House's programs and services. Um, Hope House has done an incredible job gaining partnerships beyond just Lakeside. I mean, 98% of the funding comes from private donations through individuals, uh, groups, corporations, foundations. Um, and then one of the things, this is just a really interesting fact for myself and, and knowing Lakeside's heart, one of the, in fact, the most identified barrier that Hope House community members face is actually uh, mental health challenges. And I know we're so passionate here about that at Lakeside, and so that was uh, really neat, but uh, you don't need me talking about Hope House. Why don't you just join me in welcoming Jaya James to the stage. Now, do you want a black car? I'm okay for today. Oh, awesome. Well, I do want to hear about Hope House, but I understand a little bit of your story. You and I have had coffee a few times. I want everyone else to know a little bit about you. We love people. We love their stories. And one of the things I heard was before you were at Hope House, this is my wording. I own it, okay? But you had like a nice, cushy government desk job. And then you went into the charitable sector. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about that and why, why, why the big move. All right. So, um... I had two previous jobs to the one at Hope House. I worked at a commercial bank as an account manager there, and then I had a job doing uh, food policy at the Ontario government. My mother thought those were fantastic jobs because they all came with pension plans and, you know, guaranteed job security. Um, But I hit this point in my life, and I've been working for about 15, 16 years, where there was just something I knew that was missing. And I had things that I loved to do, and I had things that I made money at, and I had things that I was good at. And I had things that I was doing that the world needed, but they weren't all kind of coming together. And so I felt this really strong sense that something needed to change. And my husband told me something needed to change because I was quite miserable by by that piece. He says, you've got to do something. Mm. Um, So I prepared up my resume and, and I sent it off to all these people I knew that I really respected. And I said, I need a change. Here's my resume. If you see something that you think would be a good fit, let me know. Because I had no idea as to where I was supposed to go. And Bob Moore, who attends here, um, sent, me a, sent me back a message almost immediately. And he said, Jaya, I think you need to apply for the executive director position at Hope House. And I said... Thanks, Bob. Yeah. And I said, okay. <laughs> and so that's what I did is I applied for it. Didn't think I was going to get it. But, you know, here we are two and a half years later. Wow. Amazing. And so what was it that drew you to Hope House? What are the, tell us a little bit about Hope House. Like, what was that exciting about that? Okay. So um, for me, the thing that right away that captured my heart about Hope House is this phrase that they use all the time, which is that the opposite of poverty is community. And mm. for my family, um, community is a really key Um, part of our identity. So we would often say that part of what we feel our purpose in the world is, is to help create communities. And so here I was with this organization that said um, poverty isn't about a lack of resources so much as a lack of community to support you. And so that's what Mm. really drew me into Hope House. Wow. Wow. And now give us a little bit of like a, like, I mean, I wish you could summarize. I've walked through Hope House. So I know it's not something that we can quickly describe, but give us like a, not the elevator speech, but like, let us know like what is, you know, with word pictures, (laughs) what happens at Hope House on a weekly basis and some of the things going on there? Right. 
Um, so Hope House started off initially with um, having a food market where people could go grocery shopping for food items. And we basically assigned to individuals virtual dollars. So it's as close to a grocery shop experience. Um, and then kind of over time, other pieces got added on. So we have a clothing market. We have a community breakfast. We have a cafe that operates four days a week. You guys are running a great garden project out here that's helping to provide fresh food to our food market. We also have the Circles program, which anyone who's ever been in a small group will completely understand circles. It's all about the idea of using intentional friendships to make changes in our lives. So individuals, primarily um, single moms, who have decided that they want to make changes for their family and lead their family out of poverty are partnered with individuals that are middle to upper income who teach them all those hidden rules that you're supposed to learn from your family members, but because of often generational poverty issues or other things going on, you haven't learned. So that's one of the really fun ones that we get to do. And then there's a whole sway of a gazillion other things that we could talk about. But I think the biggest thing I always say to everyone is if you really want to know what Hope House is like, come for a visit. I will gladly take anybody on a tour. If you don't have time to physically come in the building, we actually have a virtual tour on our website. So first on the front homepage, you can slide down and you can tour through the whole building. and It'll give you a, a tiny feel of what goes on. Awesome. Although I recommend, I went for the real tour, and it's awesome. So I highly recommend that. And you said anybody can come? Anybody can come. Yo, let's overwhelm her schedule, and let's just, <laughs> let's just get in there, okay? Because uh, she doesn't have enough things to do. Wait, are you personally going to tour us? I'll personally tour you. She's like, actually, I'm going to now hire someone to do just yeah, tours yeah. for Lake Siders. <laughs> That's awesome. So then, uh, uh, this is, I want to have you so much more. I want to ha have this relationship continue to grow, because we just are so passionate about this. Um, but tell us just kind of first glance, how do people get involved with Hope House? What are the different ways that we can get involved with that? So um, there's a number of different ways that you can get involved at Hope House. And one of the things that I really like to kind of emphasize to people is that volunteering is a fantastic way of getting involved. And that when you volunteer, and I'm really, this is a big, big thing for me. When you volunteer, it needs to give you energy. There's so many things in life that you have to do. I'm sure you can all list them and name them for me that volunteering is that one spot where it should be feeding you back. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of that two-way street because you're sharing your gift, but you're also being fed back. So volunteering is a great opportunity. And I say anything that you're passionate about, we're doing. We have music programs. We have crocheting and art programs. We have like food programs. We have retail programs. Anything you can think of, I pretty much can guarantee that we're doing. And if not, Find a place where you can do that because it will feed you more than you can possibly imagine. And I do believe that's really how God calls us to be the hands and feet in the world is by volunteering. Um, other ways you can do is prayer. And that's because prayer really does change things. And one of the biggest things that changes is us. When we pray, it gives God a chance and an opportunity to speak to us and to work on whatever it is that needs to be worked on. And we all have different things at different times. And that is, to me, one of the most powerful things that can happen because for me, as I was journeying to what was my change going to be, like I was meeting with my spiritual director and we were praying regularly. So that was kind of part of preparing me and so that I was ready for that. Um, another way that you can kind of be involved at Hope House is really literally coming down for a tour so you can kind of be an ambassador in the community and telling the community as to what's going on and what things are happening there and how they can participate and be involved. And then the last thing, which is the same thing that every charity will say, is you can also give of your financial resources. Or at Hope House, we have like donating of food, clothing, all sorts of different items can also be benefit. Mm. And I don't know if you know this, but there's actually boxes right at our front door that are labeled Lakeside Hope House. And you can literally weekly, you do that. It's great if you have young kids, like when you're shopping, just have a part of your cart that's for Hope House and literally grab those and bring those every week. That's a thing that you can do. Um, and then you have an event coming up. We do. Tell us about this event because it sounds sick. All right. <laughs> <laughs> haven't heard that phrase in a long time. Um, <laughs> wait, wait, wait till you tell them about the event. Yeah, no. I'm still living in the 90s. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So this Friday is our Hope in the Street, um, and it's our family street party. This is going to be our fifth anniversary. It is on Father's Day weekend, so it's a great chance to take out the dad or any of the dad-like mentor people in your life. Mm. And we have taken over the McDonnell parking lot this year. So we've moved it slightly. It's not on Cork Street. It's actually in the McDonnell parking lot right beside Dietmar Tire. And the reason we did that is last year we moved part of the event in there and people didn't come back out. 
And so all the food vendors wanted to be in there. So there's usually between about 2,500 people who show up. There's going to be live music the entire time. We have the stage set up, so if you want to be in the action, you can. If you're more like me and prefer to kind of be a little bit outside of the action, you can do that too. Um, all the food is $10 or less because our community members, that's what we call the people who come to Hope House, they come there. This is the biggest event that they participate in with us. And there's also some um, local breweries and um, a Dixon's Distillery and a cider vendor as well. Someone's really excited about that in the front row. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Amazing. So, and that's, date, give us this, the date again. This Friday, the 14th, starts at 5, ends at 11, come and go. I can't even do 11 with my hands. I was trying to do that for, for the visual, you know, trying to get all the different teaching styles. Uh, can we do something? Can we pray for you before you go? Can we stand? And uh, we're actually going to stretch our hands out, and we're going to pray over Jaya. Jaya, come on over here. And uh, I don't know. Oh, oh, it's rolling. Here, I'll hold that. Here we go. Let's just stretch out our hands if that doesn't trip your weird meter, and just pray over Jaya and everything that she represents and what's happening at Hope House. Father, thank you. I love my time with Jaya. I feel connected to your heart and the things that you are most passionate about when we connect. I sense that again today. God, that as we spend the next 12 weeks immersed in the Gospels, discovering Jesus, I know you're going to grow our heart for the things that your heart beats for. We thank you for Hope House. We thank you for all the people that have invested over the years and continue to invest. We thank you for steps of faith like Jaya, like Jaya just stepping out we just bless them. We pray protection over that building, over everything that goes on there and all the different ways that Hope House reaches into this city. We want to partner together to eradicate poverty. We want to see people living lives fully alive. It's what you invite us into, Jesus, and so we're passionate about it. So we bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Thank you so much. Everybody give it up for Jaya. Thank you so much. And Jaya normally is every week, I think, in uh, her Sunday school class at church, so she had to find a sub to come, and she's actually going to then jump in the car with me and race downtown and do the double, double duty thing, and we're going to share the exact same thing at our downtown site, so uh, just so thankful. Uh, as we're getting started, if you weren't here last week, uh, I mean, in some ways, it's good because I gave homework. In other ways, it sucks because now you're behind, and some of you are like, no, I love homework. I didn't know, um, but if you, if you didn't have that information, you were away, and you don't know that you can sign up for our weekly newsletter. Um, you just, on your connection card, just say, sign me up for, the, I think there's even a box to check, and just put your email address nice and clear, and every week you'll get updates, we send links for everything that we do, and just so you can be up to date, but we are starting a brand new series today in the book of Mark, and it's our summer series, and I'm so, so pumped about it, and basically the homework is, every week you're going to read probably one chapter for the first nine weeks, and then the last three weeks, we're like, you know, you're growing in your reading abilities, so we're going to make you do two chapters, those last few, and that'll end, end by Labor Day, we just, we couldn't time it perfectly, so we kind of just gave you more homework and thought that would work. Um, but we're just going through the book of Mark, and it's going to be a, a really great series. And so if you did the homework, you read Mark chapter 1 this week. You read it maybe once, maybe over and over and over again. Um, but uh, that's where we're going. And, you know, different people probably are in the room thinking, like, what, what's the point of this series? And if you're, if you're a Jesus person, this is a really powerful series because this is a really powerful book. The book of Mark is kind of like the Reader's Digest version of the life of Jesus. It's just like all action. It's like Jesus did this, and then he did this, and then he did this. If you want to quickly immerse yourself in the person of Jesus, this is the book. And the thing that we discover about the book of Mark is when the author wrote it, what he was telling us was, because he, he even says at times, and Jesus taught, and then the crowds were amazed. And it's like, what did Jesus teach? He's like, he doesn't even tell us often. Mark is really concerned with the actions of Jesus and showing us that discipleship often is about proximity with Jesus. That there's something powerful just about being around Jesus and seeing the way that he lives, seeing the way he interacts with people. And as Jesus followers, because we're all about growing in our relationship with Jesus, it's so important just to immerse ourselves in Jesus' culture, to just discover how he lived and what he did and how he interacted with different people in different ways. And so that's going to be a really great journey. I'm super stoked about it. I've been loving it. I've been reading it every day, kind of leading up to this. And I'm, I'm super pumped about that. If you're here and you're kind of like... I think I'm religious, I'm a little bit skeptical. I, I, maybe you grew up in church and now you're like, but I don't know, I have so many questions and I started reading the Bible and I found some things and people told me there's some things in there and I'm kind of confused and I don't quite get it all. I love this thing that Paul the Apostle said in the book of Hebrews. He said, Jesus 
is the exact representation of God. That what he was saying was, he's like, you want to study theology, you want to understand all the things of God, start with Jesus, because Jesus is perfect theology. That everything you ever wanted to know about God, anything you ever read, is God this, and is he angry, and is he, how, how does that work? And what is it? It's like, look at Jesus. Look at Jesus, look at Jesus. He answers that question for us. And so as you're kind of wrestling with those things and trying to find, it's like, start with Jesus and move backwards from there because he is the exact representation of what our God is like. And then there's maybe others of you here today and you're kind of like, you're like, ah, I'm not sure, I'm not sure. I mean, I, historically, yeah, it sounds like Jesus, you know, was a person, did some good teaching, but I'm like, I'm not sure if he's God. I'm not sure if he rose from the dead. Like, how do you kind of explain that? I've kind of been processing that because I think that's such a great question and such a good wrestling thing because beyond, you know, is Jesus cool and is he good and is it helpful, is, is it true? Is it real? Was he actually God incarnate, God in the flesh? You know, is that all real? And uh, this week, I don't know if you've been reading the news and keeping up on, on current events, but this, this week was the 30th anniversary of the massacre in Tiananmen Square. I don't know if, if you, you know that or, or what happened, but 30 years ago, students kind of rose up and began to protest the government in China. And as you kind of follow the story, and if you heard what happened, you know that then tanks kind of rolled in and literally bulldozed people, machine guns just sprayed students. And in the end, after it's all been done 30 years later, we still have no idea if it's hundreds or thousands that died because the government has done everything they can to try and hide it and disguise it and not acknowledge what happened, and yet the whole world knows. And so this week I was kind of reading articles and it was, just, it was just fascinating the way in which the government has just blocked, has blocked social media. It's like, if you say the date, if you try and talk about it, people got arrested for singing songs about it in, in that country. It was just like, it was a thing. It was like, anywhere else, it's like, if there's a site where there's a massacre or a tragedy, you're gonna have people that have a memorial on that day. But the only thing you could find in Tiananmen Square this past week was SWAT vehicles, making sure that nobody was talking about what happened. And the thing that, the, like, it amazes me about the human being, but it's like something happened and the government has done everything to hide it, and yet we know it happened because people experienced it. That people saw it. People lost family members, and they will never, ever forget. And as much filtering and as much hiding and as much threatening and arresting that happens, it's like because something happened, they will not stop speaking out. And they will not stop moving this ball forward that something unjust happened. And we know that, and we don't deny it, because it's real. And as a Jesus person, I mean, it, one, it, it grieves me, because I'm like, that's not what God has for the world. That kind of power and control, it's not what God has for us. But beyond that, it, it draws me in, because when you talk about the life of Jesus, and people ask, like, well, was he really God, and did he really exist, and did he really rise from the dead? Like, is that actually a thing? I remember talking to someone once about, you know, faith, and they were kind of like, yeah, I, I don't know if I can believe the Jesus accounts, because, and he, he kind of said this, he says, history is written by the winners. Whoever wins in war writes the history how they want it to be, and the losers are dead, so they can't argue with it. He's like, so the religious elite and the religious powerful, they just wrote history they, the way they wanted and everyone's believing it and we're still believing it 2,000 years later and that's how it is. And yet when you look at history, you discover an entirely different narrative. That you can look at things you know, hundreds of years ago and you can say there were ways in which Jesus people leveraged not the Jesus way but the human way, power and control and did horrible atrocities to push their way forward and called it the Jesus way. You have that, you do have that in history, let's not deny it. But when you go back 2,000 years to the first century, the Christians weren't the winners, they were the losers. They were the, were the ones that were beat up, they were made fun of, they were literally kebobbed on stakes and lit on fire to light Nero's circus. Like, it was horrible the things they went through. That they were threatened with their lives if they would just, so that they would just say that this didn't happen. And yet 2,000 years later, this Jesus movement has exploded because people saw something and experienced something in that day that they could not deny. That when historians actually research legend and they've actually like mathematized, is that a word, mathematized? Or anyways, calculated, I don't know. I, yeah, I'm apparently not the one. But when they actually do the research, they're like, there's a formula to how to start a legend. It's, it's amazing. It's fascinating to read up on. And like one of the first things you need to do is make sure that everybody who was there is dead before you ever start telling people what happened. It's like if I were to say, hey, last week something amazing happened here at Lakeside. I was preaching. It was an awesome sermon. And then I started flying around the room. It's like immediately everyone's like, no, that didn't happen because you were there. The fascinating thing to me is that you know, historians, even non-Jesus people, have documented even the book of Mark, for example, that we're going to study. And they're like, it was around 65. It was around 65 AD, which means when this stuff was published and there was a movement growing, 
People who were there who saw it, because this was a public event. It wasn't something in a back room that everyone came out and said, you won't believe what happened. You didn't see it. There's no film. But it's like, this is a public event. It's recorded in history. And everyone was there. And it would have been very easy for people to be like, no, that never happened. And no, 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 I'm sure it never happened. But instead, it was like this movement continued to grow against opposition, against violence, because people were convinced that they saw something. They experienced someone. There was a resurrected Savior that they couldn't explain. People from other faiths were converting because they were just so blown away by it. And that's why I love the book of Mark. It was literally written while the people who would have experienced that were still alive. And so I like to just pause and say like, hey, like if you're wrestling with this whole Jesus and faith stuff, like, like journey on with us. Like I, I like to say audit the course. You don't have to commit, but you can kind of audit and explore and look and everything. But you have to wrestle with this history. That you have to rest, not just like, do I like Jesus or not? Is it good values I can teach my kids? But it's like, did God actually step into human history and turn things around in a way that even the losers of history continue to push on and risk their lives because they were so convinced and refused to deny what they had experienced? And we're gonna, as I said, in September, actually have a whole series kind of on skepticism and doubt and reason and philosophy and proofs of science and all that. We're gonna get into that. But just wanted to kind of start off a series and say, this is amazing to me. That this was written when people who had actually walked with Jesus and heard him teach were still alive to say, yeah, that's exactly what happened. And it continued to get passed down from generation to generation. So if you want to turn in your Bibles to the book of Mark, we're going to get going. And uh, today we're kind of on a shorter time, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just have a, a truncated version of where we're going. But Mark chapter 1, and I love Mark, He's, maybe because it's my namesake, he spells it wrong, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> In the French Bible, it's Mark with a C, just saying, okay? Uh, Mark chapter one, I love this. He just jumps right into it, okay? The beginning of the good news, and immediately, I'm just, you just gripped. If you were reading this in the first century, you know that the words they used for good news was evangelion, which was the word that they used to describe when Caesar was born, okay? So it's like, the beginning of the good news is like, this is big news. He uses that same word from Roman government, and he says this, beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, it's like, let me use this amazing term that was used for Caesar, but for some carpenter from some rusty, dusty armpit town called Nazareth. It's like, already Mark's just like kicking it into gear. And then he says this, Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, which is fun because the Romans used to kind of deify their rulers. And so Caesar, they declared him this way and they actually thought he was a God. And so Mark's just like, I'm not wasting any time. I'm getting right into this. And then from here on in, if you read it this week, you're just like, this story is overwhelming. It's just like, pop, pop, pop. It just keeps coming at you. It's just like more and more. And it's like, and then Jesus, and then he went, and then he left, and then he went to do this, and when he went to that. And what he's trying to just say is like, this story is exciting. And so what I want to do quickly today is I want to kind of go in that same theme of pop, pop, pop. And I'm probably going to like hit a bunch of the stories, hit some things maybe you had question marks about, maybe jump over some things. You're like, I really hope he speaks about this because I'm really confused. So just, you know, have to Google it or something. I don't know. Uh, no, shoot me an email if you want to chat about that. But, but that's kind of what we're going to do today. I'm just going to kind of bottom line, probably about eight different times, bottom line, here's what's happening in this moment. And I don't want you to try and remember all eight of those bottom lines. I just want you, as we always say, is just have a pen and paper. And if God speaks to you about something in that moment, it might just be one thing. We're going to ask for one thing for each of you. Just take a note of that and wrestle with him. God, what are you saying to me today through that thing, okay? So let's go fast forward to verse eight. We have the whole John the Baptist uh, thing, and we're not even gonna cover John the Baptist. Here's the thing that you learned from John the Baptist if you read it, okay? Some of you maybe have thought to yourself, like, why don't we have a dress code for the preacher? Like, I feel like he could up his game a little bit. Read John the Baptist, you'll be thankful for what I wear, okay? That's all I gotta say. <laughs> you did your homework, I'm so proud of you. <laughs> so anyways... John the sketchy dude, hey? <laughs> God can use anybody. I baptize you with water. This is John. He kind of calls the community together. He's like, something big is happening. He calls them together. They come out. He's like, I'm baptizing you with water. This was a ritual cleansing they were doing, okay? Ritual cleansing. But he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. That John is, says he's preparing the way for someone who's to come, and he says, he's gonna baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Here's what us Jesus people believe. We believe that we were made for relationship and intimacy with God. We see that on page one of the scriptures. And then we also see that humans chose to kind of live their lives apart from him, and that's where sin entered the world. We talk a lot about that. I'm not going to unpack it totally today, but that's a big thing that we believe, and yet we believe that God set in, in, in plan, uh, set a plan in place 
to reconcile us to himself, to join back in relationship with us. That's what Trifina was talking about, day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit coming in. And so he's saying, there's someone coming who's gonna help you re-encounter the presence of the living God. And in other gospels, he talks about he's gonna take away your sins and he's gonna give you the Holy Spirit. And we love to talk about that at Lakeside and say often, you know, religious people, we stop at sin. It's like Jesus came to take away sin and we never actually say, and for what? It's so that we can be back in relationship to God. Any gospel that stops with sin doesn't end with renewed intimacy with Jesus is not the whole gospel. It is so important that John is saying someone is coming and he's gonna make things right in the world and ultimately he's gonna put you back in relationship with your heavenly father through the Holy Spirit. And then Jesus comes and Jesus is baptized. And he said, this, I love this part, verse 10. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. Just love this. In this moment, it's, it says descending on him, but in the Greek, it's actually descending into him. And so it's like Jesus goes down and he's baptized. And then all of a sudden, this, this dramatic, it's like heaven is torn open and a dove comes down. It's like people expect God to come in fierce and punching and swinging and yelling. It's like this drastic where heaven comes and touches earth and it's a dove. Can you think of a more gentle way to describe the presence of God and yet that's what Jesus experiences in this moment? That immediately we're confronted with the fact that Jesus is about to show us what a life filled with the Spirit is like. At the bottom line in this moment is that when you read the book of Mark, you're not just reading to see what great things God does when he steps into the world, but it's actually what great things we can do when we invite the Holy Spirit to be fully in our lives. And so as we look at the narratives, we actually look at them and not just you know, stand back and applause, but we actually say, how do I step into that? And how do I do that more? Because scripture is really clear. It is the same spirit, the same spirit that was on Jesus, the same spirit that rose him from the dead that is with us as well. Jesus shows us how to live a spirit-filled life. And then I love that it's like after the baptism, it's not like, and then they went out to the cafe and had a baptism party. No shame, okay, that's great if you do that. But it's like, now what happened? It's like they didn't have this big lingering in the glory of the baptism. It's just like, look where it goes, right to action again. At once, the Spirit sent him, or the other word is, drove him out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals and angels attended him. It's like the moment that Jesus is baptized, he's got a mission. The moment he's baptized, it's not just like, wasn't that a great baptism? That was so wonderful. Oh, congratulations. And here's your certificate. Not that, again, none of that's bad, but it's just now how it went. It's like Jesus is baptized with the Spirit, and all of a sudden, he's on mission. He has a purpose in his life, and he's off to the desert to confront Satan. That He's out there with a purpose. It's the reason why when we baptize people here at Lakeside, we have a whole prayer team ready to pray for them because we know the moment that you say, I'm going public with my faith, my life is lived on behalf of Jesus, to live the Jesus way, we know the temperature just got amped and things are about to get a lot harder. There's a big target on your back. And so we have a whole prayer team dedicated to praying for you the moment that you come out because we know the moment you go public with that, things get a little bit harder. Temptation goes a little bit up. We used to say, this is kind of cheesy, so I won't put it on the screen, but we used to say, new, new, new level, new devil. It's like the moment you step into something big that God is calling you to, all of a sudden, the enemy, the invisible forces of evil that we battle against, all of a sudden, he's engaged all of a sudden. Some of you are like, I don't understand why my life's so easy and everyone else is so hard. It's like, maybe he has no threat. He sees no threat in you. Others of you is like, why is it so hard? It's like, are you pushing forward in the way that Jesus did? Are you inviting the spirit to use you to push back darkness in the way that Jesus did? Because then Satan gets angry and things start to get heavy. I talk to friends all the time. It's like the moment they step into something, the moment they said yes, the car breaks down. They start finding rats in the house. It's like things, you know, kids start fighting in a way they never did. It's like the moment you step into your God-given destiny, what you were commissioned for at baptism, things start to get hard. Bottom line, when you get baptized, when you go public, you are not just celebrating something. You are being commissioned for war. And I love the part in that story where it's like, and the angels attended to him. And it actually, it's actually like they were there all 40 days caring for him. And I'm kind of like, he's God. 
He's God in the flesh. Like, why does he need help? He's fine. He's out in the desert for 40 days. Great. He's, you know, arguing with Satan and, you know, dealing with temptation. Great, but he's God. And it's like, but even, even Jesus, and this just, it just makes me so happy to see, even he needs comforting. Even he receives the help of community. That as Jesus' people, when you are baptized, you are brought into a new family, all of a sudden, we no longer do life on our own. We are made for community. It is okay, as we said in our mental health series, to not be okay and to be honest about it. That Jesus shows us that even though he's fully God, fully man, it's okay to rely on others for help and for comfort. Then verse 14, just kind of trucking along here. After John was put in prison, this is interesting, John's one of Jesus' closest friends. Jesus went out to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. This is fascinating to me. There are things that Jesus does and Jesus says, and I'm like, how do those things go together? It's like, your friend just got baptized and you're telling people there's good news. And this is where you pause and you just kind of realize, like, if there are times in which God's doing great things and bad things are still happening. You see this all throughout Jesus's life, that he's able to jump into any situation. He knows what's going on. He wept when Lazarus died, even though he knew he was gonna raise him from the dead. It's like, there's this tension in which Jesus was continually entering into. So his best friend goes to bring him, and then Jesus, first time he speaks in the book of Mark, proclaiming the good news of God, and what does he say? He says, the time has come, he said, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent, which means turn from the life you've been living. Repent, best description is just a 180, okay? Repent and believe the good news. The kingdom of God is at hand. What was he saying? Do you know what the kingdom of God is? The kingdom is anywhere that is the king's domain. And so Jesus in this moment is saying, the king is at hand. The king, and it's actually tied to the language of him actually being here. And he's like, me being here means the kingdom is at hand. And it's interesting because the Jewish people believe that one day God was gonna sit back in his throne and take over the world and he was gonna send the Messiah. The Messiah is the word that John used to describe Jesus. And Jesus is like, the kingdom's at hand. And you just imagine people are confused because when they talked about Messiah and king, they pictured the kind of kings they had in their world, which was someone who just kicks down the door and with power and control takes over everything. And what you discover in Jesus is that the kingdom is about presence and not about power. That Jesus steps in. He says, you're gonna get a taste of the kingdom. It is at hand. Christians believe that when Jesus came, he brought a taste of heaven with him. That everything you see Jesus do, you see a sample or a glimpse of what the kingdom of heaven will be like when one day God is on his throne fully ruling over everything, takes everything back under his authority that Jesus is giving us a glimpse of that. That when you look at the things that Jesus does and the way that he interacts, you just remember that everything he does is a taste of heaven. It's a taste of the kingdom. And then Jesus just kind of declares, like, the kingdom of God is at hand. It's like, what amazing thing are you gonna do? What is the first act of this kingdom being at hand? I love it. Oh, sorry, I actually don't have a slide for this one. But you did your homework, so you know it. He called some friends to come alongside him. He called his disciples. He broke the mold of the religious elite. He's like, I'm not looking for the educated people. I'm not looking for the theologians. I'm not looking for the smartest of the smart. He calls the common folk, the blue-collared workers. He calls some fishermen. Later on, he's going to call some tax collectors, which were kind of like the hated people in culture. The first thing that Jesus does is he invites people in and he has no requirements for them. The thing that you discover in the book of Mark immediately is that when Jesus invites people to be with him and to follow him, there's no prerequisites. It's like an apprenticeship. It's on the job training. The only requirement is your presence. The only requirement to say is I wanna be in your proximity. I'm gonna follow you. I'm gonna learn from you. It is the only requirement. It's the first thing that Jesus does. He says, I'm breaking down the mold. I'm getting rid of the religious elite and the religious non-elite and the common folk. He's like, I'm just inviting people, people. Just normal people to come and follow me. And it's amazing because the thing that you discover when he calls them is that they they leave their jobs, they leave their family business, they leave their families to go and follow him. And it wasn't that they were abandoning work and abandoning their kids and all that, but it was like immediately the moment you decide to follow Jesus, big shifts are happening. 
It wasn't just this like, yeah, I'm free on Tuesday nights for an hour. I can come to your class and, you know, incorporate that into my life a little bit. It's like all of a sudden, everything changed when he began to follow Jesus. It was a big deal. That's why at Lakeside, we have one of our core values is everyone can move forward. Everybody can begin that journey. And the thing that struck me about this passage that I think is so, so important for us people who are wanting to follow Jesus is that we have an open-handed posture. That when Jesus called people, their preconceived ideas of what they're gonna do is like, yep, I'm just gonna follow the family business and then pass it on to my son and he'll pass it on to his son. It's like all of a sudden, because they came open-handed and were willing to follow Jesus, they were able to follow him into everything. When you're following Jesus, the best posture you can have is open hands. I talk to so many people, it's like, yeah, I'm, I'm new to faith or I'm a Christian, but like, as long as I don't have to, and then they state what it is, whether it's, you know, about their retirement, I already have this plan, I already have this beach home, or, you know, relationally, this is what I believe, not this. And so as long as I don't have to change any of that, and I'm like, uh, to me, I don't pause and say, like, actually, Jesus is not for that, and Jesus doesn't have that plan for that. I don't do that, but I'm like, listen, listen, listen. The moment you come locked down into the presence of the creator of the universe and say, I want everything you have for me, but I already made up my mind about these issues. You miss out on what God has for you. The greatest posture you step into the presence of God is say, my future is yours. All I have is yours. I want what you have for me. And I know it might be terrifying. You might call me to leave my business plan. You might call me to leave everything I've always wanted, change careers. We hear about that from Jaya today. She's like, I, you know, it was comfortable, but I'm open to where Jesus is leading me. If you don't have that open-handed posture, you can say, I'm nervous about this. I'm nervous Jesus might you know, challenge me on this, call me on this, invite me to do this, invite this in my finances and not this, and I was really hoping for this and not that. The greatest posture you can have is open-handedness when stepping into the presence of Jesus. Then the next story that really gripped me, and uh, it's you know, Jesus in verse 27, he says, you know, goes to the crowd and he's healing people. You know, the people were all amazed that they asked each other, what is this? Oh, actually, sorry. I obviously bit off more than I can chew. I'm losing myself today. Huh, wanna go there? Let's not go there. Let's go to verse. It's kind of a choose your own ending sermon. I planned that, don't worry. <laughs> yeah, let's go there. Let's go there. This is my favorite. Okay. The, the people were all amazed that they asked each other, because remember, Jesus is teaching, driving out demons. What is this? A new teaching and with authority. In the Greek, it's actually supernatural authority. It's like, we've had teachers, religious teachers, we're not short on, but Jesus, he teaches with a supernatural authority we can't explain, right? He even gives orders to impure spirits, and they obey him, okay? If you have in your life a teaching role, whether you're a like me, a, a preacher, you teach your kids, you, you feel the need to you know, teach other people in a small group, anything like that. Jesus in this moment summarizes what I believe is good biblical preaching, okay, and teaching. So just take note of this, okay? Even if you're teaching your kids a Bible story, this is such a good tip, okay? Good Bible teaching, good Jesus teaching is not about knowing the Greek, quoting theologians whose names we can't pronounce. It is about punching Satan in the face, that's what it's about. If you use your words to call out the lies of Satan, remember his goal is destruction, his tool is deception. If you can do that with your teaching, you are winning. My pastor used to tell me all the time when he was teaching me how to preach, he said, Mark, at the end of all my sermon prep, I pause and ask the Holy Spirit, where does Satan get beat up in my sermon today? That that is the thing that you wanna do with all your teaching, you wanna just call out the lies. You wanna call out the lies that Satan has for the community. As you're reading these stories, you're seeing some very intense demonic activity, and you're like, does that still happen today? Do people, I'm like, I actually believe it does. I think there's, this is just my own personal thoughts. I think in North America, Satan's so happy to fly under the radar, and just the greatest lie he ever told was that he didn't even exist. And so his greatest MO in North America, in my opinion, is that he just throws lies everywhere. The greatest thing that you can do when you're telling people about Jesus, when you're teaching your kids, when you're teaching Sunday school, when you're uh, you know, in your small group, is you can just pause and say, hey, do you believe that? It's not true. It's not true. Because lies are so, so, so destructive. And so there's something so powerful about calling out those lies. <sighs> Let's go. Sorry, I'm just kind of choosing my own ending here. Let's go verse 33. The whole town gathered. If you read this week, you saw this at the door. And Jesus healed many 
And, and the term many actually in that time says like all that were sick. All that were sick in this massive crowd, many who had various diseases. And in that moment, I'm like, there's Mark writing his book, summarizing, using the power of efficiency, which I love. And he's just like, Jesus healed many people. It's very efficient. And yet right before that, he tells a story of Jesus healing an individual, Simon's mother-in-law. He actually walks into her house, looks her in the face, heals her of her sickness. I'm like, you could have just thrown her in with the many. Why'd you have to give that example? I think Mark was trying to do two things. Number one, he was trying to show, yeah, Jesus did these incredible things, but he's also very personable. He knew people's names. He talked to them. He looked at them in the eyes. He didn't just like walk past the crowd, make them all well, peace, right? Like, he was intentional. People, community were very important. Second thing about that story is it says that when she was healed, she began to wait on them. She began to serve them. And it just makes me angry that so often this story has been used to say, and see, a healthy woman is one that's serving men. (laughs) Crazy. It's not even what the story was trying to say. It says that she served them. The actual word that is used is the same word that describes what the angels did with Jesus when he was in the desert, took care of. It's the same words that Jesus used to describe himself when he said, I didn't come to be served, but to serve others. It's a characteristic of kingdom life. The moment she has an encounter with Jesus, the first thing that she does in response to it is she just wants to give away. There's a charity, there's a hospitality that flows out of an encounter with God that just wants to serve others and not yourself. The thing to take away from that story is not gender roles. The thing to take away from that story is when you have an encounter with God, you want to help and serve other people, not yourself. That's so often people are like, how do I grow in my faith? And is there a course for this? And I'm like, stop taking courses. I'm good with courses. But it's like, as my pastor used to say, we're educated beyond our obedience, we got all this Bible knowledge. We have all these things like, did you know? And in the Greek and in the Hebrew, it's like all this stuff. It's like, you want to grow in your faith? You want to mat- grow in maturity? You want to grow in being able to bring the kingdom, the presence of God into this world? Serve. That'll grow you. That's why we've been pushing this idea of say yes. It's not because we need people. It's because we need all of us to step into our God-given destiny. And if you're not in a place where you're like, oh, I, just, I just don't want to serve. I just don't have that. It's like, okay. But just so you know, service is the result of when kingdom comes into the world, when the presence of God encounters you. That the more you know Jesus and fall in love with Jesus, and the more mature you are as a Christian, it actually means the more that you want to serve others and not yourself, because that is a mark of what happens when people encounter the presence of God. Let me invite the, the band to come up, and we'll close with this. I don't know if you caught it, but near the end of the passage, it says Jesus went out to pray. Now, as a person who loves action, type A type person, I love the book of Mark because it's just like pop, pop, pop. Here we go, here we go. And it's so driven. And as I was studying it this week, one author remarked, he said, it's the same language that Mark uses to explain. He went out to the crowd. He went out to teach. He went out to heal. He went out to do all these things. And it's the same word. He's like, I think he was actually trying to like use those words to describe. And he went out to pray. It was an action moment. That what we discover in that moment is Jesus is just as passionate about going out to do good things as he is to be intimate with his heavenly father. It was just as important for him to be present with God. That to me, I read that story and, and all the whole time I'm kind of like, I'm like, oh man, I suck. Like Jesus was caring for the poor. He's driving out demons. He's doing all these things. I'm like, how does he have capacity for all that? And there's a sense in which you can get overwhelmed as Jesus people, like, I, I'm never gonna measure up, I'm never gonna be able to do it. And yet the thing we see is that Jesus is like, but I still need to pause. Because all of this is about presence with my heavenly Father. And just as much as he was baptized with the Spirit to go out and to defeat Satan and to usher in the kingdom, he was ushered also into the presence of God. That it was so important that in the midst of all the to-dos and all the should-dos, he's just like, and you can see it's like, everybody's looking for you. And he's just like, I just want to spend time with my dad. I just want to pause and say, hey, we're going to go into this book because we want to be a force to be reckoned with. 
that I know there's a reason you applauded when you heard the idea that Hope House wants to eradicate poverty. It's like, we wanna kick down the doors of darkness and usher the kingdom in, in our city, in our region, in our world. And yet Jesus pauses, he's like, and as you're doing that, don't ever forget, you are not just meant to do, you were meant to be, you were meant to be with your heavenly father. Don't forget it, don't miss it. It's a great way to start our series to be reminded that he didn't just die on the cross so that we could be saved from our sin so that we can be in intimacy with our Heavenly Father. As you go, I want to remind you, our prayer teams are always up at the front. If you see them with a name tag, just come on up. You may have to wait. I think there's been a lot of traffic lately, but that's a good thing. Uh, I want to remind you as well, Say Yes Boot Lounge out there. Just Our staff will be out there happy to just chat, conversation, and discuss what does it mean serving at Lakeside. There's a Hope House table, lots of information there. And uh, as you go, I just want to bless you. It's Pentecost Sunday. May you encounter his presence. May it transform you from the inside out. And may you begin to see glimpses of what you see in the book of Mark happening in your life, the way you interact, the way you speak, the way that you live. Go in Jesus' name.